I am Peter Lee, and this is NewsBuds China Watch. This week, the Trump administration tips its hand in Asia. Enough tinder has been stacked in Asia to light off several world wars. Pretty much all of the scenarios involve China. This week, in the wake of Secretary of Defense James Mattis's inaugural trip to Asia, we're going to look at four of them. South China Sea, East China Sea, North Korea, and Iran, and see where the Trump administration might be pouring the gasoline. First, the easy one, the South China Sea. Much was made in the libosphere about some remarks that Steve Bannon, Trump's Richelieu, his Rasputin, or his worm tongue, depending on which analogy you prefer, made in 2016 that we would be at war with China in five to 10 years, no doubt, because of China's island building aggrandizement in the South China Sea. Never say never, but I think we can put the South China Sea war to rest for now. When Bannon made those remarks, the pivot was in full flower. The Navy was itching to hype the China threat and a strongly pro-US administration was in power in the Philippines and ready to advance the anti-China strategies formulated in Washington. Since then, of course, Rodrigo Duterte was elected in the Philippines and shifted Philippines foreign policy away from United Front confrontation to bilateral rapprochement with the People's Republic of China. Without an aggrieved treaty ally begging the U.S. for help to resist Chinese aggression, the U.S. doesn't have much standing to confront China in the South China Sea, unless the PRC does something absolutely stupid like fortifying its artificial islands with offensive weapons and threatening freedom of navigation, which I don't think it's going to do right now. Instead, the PRC is now showering goodies on the Philippines and Vietnam, and the Philippines and Vietnam are hoovering up those goodies, and I expect making it clear to the Trump administration that they aren't looking forward to the U.S. upsetting the South China Sea apple cart with a war right now. Don't have to guess with the Philippines. Its defense minister said he didn't think a U.S.-China war over the South China Sea was in the cards. And Secretary of Defense Mattis used the occasion of his swing to Asia to announce that, quote, there is no need right now at this time for military maneuvers or something like that that would solve something that's best solved by the diplomats. So it looks like the much ado over Rex Tillerson's comments over denying access to the South China Sea Islands was, as I wrote a couple weeks ago, much ado about nothing. In fact, Tillerson just walked his statement back. So let's put war over the South China Sea on the back burner for now at least until the U.S. manages to engineer the overthrow of Rodrigo Duterte. That will take at least a year, according to the timetable the U.S. government is allegedly working off. How about war over the East China Sea, specifically over the disputed Senkaku Islands? Secretary Mattis affirmed that Article 5 of the Mutual Security Treaty between the United States and Japan covered the Senkakus, which the Chinese insist on calling the Diaoyus. This affirmation has to be done periodically because the United States has never confirmed Japanese sovereignty over the Senkaku Islands. When Nixon returned Okinawa and all that to Japan in 1971, he set aside the issue of Senkaku sovereignty to be worked out between Taiwan, the PRC, and Japan, which didn't happen. Japan took over administration of the uninhabited islands, unilaterally declared they were part of Japan, built stuff on them, and now patrols the territorial waters. Since then, the United States has declared several times that the islands are covered by the Mutual Security Treaty. In other words, if China tries to change the status quo and take the islands by force, the U.S. may use military force to assist Japan. So Mattis's statement was relatively routine and not a huge surprise. The Chinese complained about it, but probably won't do much about it. The independence-minded DPP government on Taiwan might further aggravate the situation by renouncing the Republic of China's claims to the islands in favor of Japan, but the consequences would probably be felt in Taiwan PRC relations, not in war with Japan and the United States. So, more in the East China Sea doesn't look to be in America's inbox. How about 
North Korea. An important objective of Mattis's mission to Asia was a joint announcement with South Korea that the Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, or TAD, would be installed in South Korea this year. The debate over TAD is part of a five-way geopolitical contest between North Korea, South Korea, Japan, China, and the United States. I have a piece up at the Newsbud website that goes into the details. Let's focus here on the official justification for the TAD system, North Korea's rogue WMD program. Mattis announced that the United States would flatten North Korea if it used nuclear weapons. No huge surprise here. The important part, in the reporting at least, was about what to do in the pre-flattening stage. Reuters wrote, quote, former U.S. officials and other experts have said the United States essentially has two options when it comes to trying to curb North Korea's fast expanding nuclear and missile programs, negotiate or take military action. What's missing from that short list of options? Denuclearization via sanctions. You know, the Obama strategic patience thing that Hillary Clinton had promised to continue? I know in the age of never Trump, we're not allowed to use the word failure with respect to the Obama administration, but Obama North Korea policy was a big fat failure. Now, everybody's quietly praying that Trump will, as I said in my January 8th China Watch episode, eat the burger, that is to say, negotiate with Kim Jong-un. This is one issue where Trump could have the Washington establishment at his back instead of on his back, at least long enough to get Obama and the Beltway think tank geniuses off the hook. Don't be an idiot, Donnie. Eat the burger. And don't be an idiot, Jong-un. Don't test an ICBM toward the United States. With this background, I'm calling odds on a civilization-ending war over North Korea two to one against. Fingers crossed. The big bad one when it comes to a breakdown of diplomacy and a chance for war is, I believe, Iran. And China is a more important factor in the Iran equation than many recognize. The Iran nuclear deal is headed for trouble. It should be understood that the first principle of Donald Trump's deal making is don't accept or endorse other people's deals, especially if they were made by Obama, supposedly the worst deal maker on the planet. This aspect of diplomacy a la Trump was in full display in the contentious phone call with Australian PM Malcolm Turnbull. Much was made of how mean Trump was to a loyal ally. How loyal? Australia has pitched in on pretty much every modern war the U.S. has fought, including Vietnam. For Trump, of course, a doormat is for wiping his shoes on, not respecting. But more importantly, he was flaying Turnbull for some deal on refugees that Obama had made to help Turnbull out of a nasty political problem. Trump, on principle, had to despise it. In Trump land, the ultimate bad deal by bad negotiator Obama is, of course, the Iran nuclear deal. It actually is a rather vulnerable deal, a piece of incrementalism like Obamacare, based on the idea that after Obama was out of office, his successors would accept it and perfect it. Well, the problem with the Iran deal is it's only rock solid US partisans are good hearted optimists and beltway Obamanistas. Now the Obamanistas are outside the White House tent while Iran hawks, starting with the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, Mark Dubowitz, and all the way up to National Security Advisor Michael Flynn are inside the tent. As for international support for the Iran deal, the EU has been keen to do business with Iran for decades and was a key stakeholder in the negotiations. But that's about it for enthusiastic international cheerleaders for the Iran agreement. And we know how much clout the EU carries with Donald Trump. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia and Israel hate the deal with a passion because they want Iran to remain a pariah state and not part of any U.S. security, diplomatic or economic equation at their expense. And they've weaponized their opposition in the U.S. domestic sphere, it looks to me, by using the MEK, a notoriously flaky Iranian immigre resistance group, as a front. The MEK's U.S. sympathizers 
recently delivered a letter to Trump calling for him to renegotiate the Iran deal. The list of signatories as an indication of the financial and diplomatic muscle apparently behind the initiative is revealing. It looks like Trump would overtly tear up the Iran deal. Instead, he can sanction it into oblivion as part of his increasingly aggressive campaign to weaken Iran and undermine its regional reach. For instance, to get the deal signed, Obama left enough wiggle room for Iran to do missile tests and enough wiggle room for the United States to object to missile tests, which Trump did, announcing a new round of sanctions on February 3rd in response to an Iranian missile test. What's China got to do with it? As US News and World Report put it, there's a hidden message for China in Trump's Iran sanctions. The not so hidden part is that a bunch of Chinese individuals and companies were sanctioned, basically, for serving as cutouts so Iran could buy stuff through China that was prohibited by US sanctions. The kind of hidden part is that Iran policy is really a covert economic war between the United States and China. Iranian oil accounts for about 10% of China's oil imports. Keeping that oil flowing, sanctions or no, is important to China's energy security. It's even more important for Iran, which counts China not only as its biggest customer, but also its friendliest. About 20% of Iran's oil exports end up in China. China's purchases give Iran a vital economic lifeline and assist it in withstanding US-led sanctions. China is also happy to exploit sanctions by backfilling, the term of art for scooping up business opportunities in Iran that US and EU corporations are denied because of sanctions. China continually pushes the envelope in undercutting US sanctions on Iran. The United States is continually working to make that envelope smaller and tighter. There's even a nuclear option available to the United States, completely cutting off Chinese financial institutions from the US, in other words, the world's financial system for violating sanctions. The US Treasury Department has been perfecting that weapon for 10 years, and China has been working on countermeasures for just as long. Internationalization of the Chinese currency, the Yuan, should be seen as part of a PRC strategy to construct a parallel international financial system centered on the Yuan in case the United States tries to cripple China's economy by denying it dollar-denominated transactions. So the Trump sanctions were a message to China, as well as Iran, that it's game on. Worst case scenario, Trump is determined to bring Iran to its knees and in the process launches a major sanctions war against China that escalates to the financial nuclear option and who knows, maybe the nuclear nuclear option. Better case scenario, Trump will be satisfied with crippling the Obama deal and keeping Iran in limbo while wrapping China on the snout with sanctions to keep it from feasting too deeply at the Iran trough. The wild card here is whether Trump gives his national security advisor, Michael Flynn, free reign to execute his hyper-aggressive anti-radical Islam strategy. Flynn's worldview reportedly regards pretty much everybody, including Iran and China, as co-conspirators in a scheme to destroy the Judeo-Christian West. If he's really running the show, maybe it's time to invest in guns, lead suits, and canned goods. I'm hoping that Trump and the anti-Iran alliance will settle for a prolonged, frozen to somewhat melty crisis with some nasty proxy wars. But I'm hard pressed to put an optimistic number on those odds. Finally, a note on Trump's immigration ban fiasco. Trump's immigration order looks like a cynical piece of public relations designed to fulfill a campaign promise to its base by temporarily messing with the visas and the lives of a few thousand vulnerable Muslim foreigners, thereby distracting from the fact that his cabinet is now an orgy room wallpapered with dollar bills and stocked with Goldman Sachs executives. Maybe Trump felt there wouldn't be too much outrage, since quite frankly, there aren't a huge number of immigrants coming in from the seven countries he designated, maybe 60,000 per year. 
They're mostly from Iran and Iraq and admitted under family preference. They presumably would have ended up coming in anyway after the famous extreme vetting. No big deal, right? Tough times for Lady Liberty, at least in cartoon land. An alternate universe Lady Liberty also figures in the most extensive exclusion by country of origin ban in American history, the Chinese Exclusion Act that barred most Chinese immigration to the United States from 1882 to 1943. Anti-Chinese bigotry generated this legendary image of the Statue of Liberty. Here, Lady Liberty is transplanted to San Francisco Bay, the port of entry for most Chinese, and transformed into a Chinese coolie clutching an opium pipe, his head on a human skull, the pedestal swarming with rats, and his halo promising to bring to America, along with the Chinese, filth, immorality, disease, and ruin to white labor. I write about this image and Trump's place in the long history of American anti-immigrant agitation. Hate is as American as apple pie. That's all for this week. Thanks for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to newsbud.com where you'll find exclusive content available only to the Newsbud community. I'm Peter Lee for Newsbud's China Watch. For just a small subscription fee, you can become a member of the Newsbud community and help keep this website running. Your subscription will provide you with full community access to exclusive content, including videos and articles from Newsbud's team of experts and analysts, as well as a members-only monthly newsletter from Newsbud's founder, Sibel Edmonds. Sign up today for full access at newsbud.com.